Good evening, friends. I didn't think I'd be speaking to you again so quick. <laughs> well, we're taught all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. <laughs> I know I love Him, and I trust that this is for good. I was quite disappointed when they told me I had to come back and have some yellow fever germs put in. <laughs> I was trying to get them out, but <laughs> if there were any in there. But uh, nations have some peculiar rulings, so I guess we have to give Caesar what Caesar's and God what God, don't we? <laughs> so they tucked me down and poked a needle in my arm, and, and I guess they're going to try it again in the morning. So <laughs> we'll try to go again in the morning, the Lord willing, to, to Africa. Talk about a surprise person was my wife a while ago when I called her. She thought I'd be in southern Rhodesia. And I teased her a little. I said, well, I'm just calling from Africa. She said, now, nah, the word come from New York. I said, well, it's coming through New York. She said, come on now. <laughs> so it was, it's a, I certainly have enjoyed the last three days here this day with you people in New York here staying with with our sister and the home down there. No wonder you have a wonderful church. That's right. I don't say that because she's sitting here. Your pastor here, my out to his home, such a lovely place. Lovely. What I mean by that, the characteristic of it. The, uh, a home isn't the house you live in. It's the order of the house. That, see, that's what makes the home. You know, as they say, a tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. I've seen people live in palaces and didn't have much of a home. <laughs> I remember one time I married a couple. I've just been ordained a short time in Baptist church. So there's a boy said, worked with my brother on the on that, um, I believe you call it NYA or CC camp. That's what it was, a CC camp. And way back in doing the time of the Depression, of course, many of you can't go back that far with me because you're not that old maybe. <laughs> But I, a lot of you here remember the Depression. <laughs> so I remember my, he was working with a boy up there. I believe the boy was, I don't know whether he was a Syrian or what he was, but the kid was a fine fellow. And he, he loved some little girl, and he said, you know what? He said, I'm going to get married as soon as I, so I got the money enough to buy the license. And said, uh, I just haven't got the money enough to pay the preacher. And so my brother said, well, I'm, my brother marries people, said he never charged anybody for anything. said, come on down. So, and he said, I, I said, well, you fix up with him. He can't. said, I'll get married Saturday. So they brought the fellow down, and it, I never felt so sorry for anyone in my life. The poor kid standing there, and I'm just as well off as anybody, but he had as much as I had. But <laughs> I looked at him, and he had a jacket on. It had been washed to the washer, not very good at that, and it, trousers, about a dollar a pair, and his little old wife standing there, a little blonde, and hitchhike, always from Minneapolis, 120 miles to meet him, get married. Poor kid didn't even have any shoes on her feet, Harley. I never broke my heart. I thought, my girl might be that way someday. I wanted to buy the little thing, a pair of shoes. I said, hurt her feelings. And she's real backward, just standing there, a beautiful little girl. And I asked them if they loved each other. He said, sure. So I said, uh, well, I remember... Happiness does not consist of how much of the world's good you own, but how contented you are with the portion that's allotted to you. So that's what it means. I said, now, there'll be times that you always see things alike, but always remember you're still in love. When you see one set in the way and the other don't, I said, give in. If they're wrong, it'll show. After a while, it'll be all right. I said, there's a little bowl in a human heart. It's full of golden oil called love. If it's ever broke, it can be healed up, but there'll be a scar there as long as you live. I said, don't never have... I said, always give to each other and remember that what your vows are. I married them. They didn't have no place to go. I had no 28 Chevrolet and the headlights was wired on with bailing wire. So he went out on the river at New Albany where there used to be an old rolling mill, an old switch yard. During the time the Depression went under, box cars and tracks tore up. He got one of those cars and got him a saw and sawed him a window in it. Work, went to work for Mingle's box company up there and he... They lived in this box car, and they had newspapers for paper on the wall with tacky button. No, I don't know where you know. How many knows what a tacky button is? Oh, I got you that time. 
somebody up there does. Well, he's not. Well, it's a, it's a tack with a piece of cardboard. You just tack it on. You see, it makes it a hole better. You see, like that. The tacky button. You know. We use them much down in the south. <laughs> so they, they had their house papered like that. And then about two months after that, a friend of mine married a real rich girl. And they, he liked me so well, he wanted me to have the wedding. So we had to rehearse it over many, many days before. And when I married him, he had to go way back in a booth of flowers and kneel on a pillow and so forth to marry him. And they built her a lovely home up on Silver Heights, which is one of the most, uh, well, the classiest place that we have in the city, up over facing the river, which is very beautiful up there. And just only very restricted to maybe twenty five, thirty thousand dollar home, the cheapest thing you can put up there. I guess theirs cost around a hundred thousand. And so one day I was down I was working for the public utilities on on line work and I had my tools on, you know, lineman, I was going down. I thought, wonder how they're getting along down there in the little cabin. So I was on Saturday and I was dirty, you know, and I was going along like I was watching the lines down through there. I slipped up close, you know, listening in the house. After a while, I went in, close to the door, and there he was, <laughs> sitting there, heading a table, built out of boxes, he had a couple of chairs, and one room, a box car, and she was sitting on his lap, and had her arms around him, and he had his hat out there, and he was counting their money out to pay their bills and see if they could cut out enough to get her one of those calico dresses to put some away for one. Just as much in love as there was. But... A few days before that, I had visited up to the E.V. night home on the hill, and when I come up, one was sitting in one corner and one in the other, and arguing, jealous, over some dance they'd been at all night. When I jumped up, they run and grab one another by the hand, come through, and say, Come in, Brother Brandon. I <laughs> put in mind of some of this gospel they talk about, you know, from way long time ago, how the Holy Ghost fell on the day of Pentecost. That's fine, but that's painted fire. You can't get warm by that. You have to have fire now to get warm by, I think. That's right. What he did back there is wonderful, but what he does today, that's different, see. That's history. This is present tense. And that painted fire reminds me of Paul Rader. How many ever heard of Paul Rader? Well, I guess you all have. He's probably preached here and years ago. He said one day, he, him and his wife, he was sitting at the table, and, oh, you know how families are. Something came up, she wanted to go somewhere, and he wouldn't let her go. So... He said, no, I just can't do it. I've got something else to do. And so he hurt her feelings. He looked over, and she was crying. So he just thought, well, cry. And he, said he got his hat and started out, and she'd always meet him at the door and kiss him goodbye when he left. Said, Brother Bram had come to the door. Said, she was standing there with her head down. Said, she kissed me goodbye, all right. Said, I went out the gate and pulled the gate together and looked back. She'd always stand at the gate and wave. And said, she was standing or stand at the door and waved as he went out the gate. Said, she was at the door. She waved. So I went on down the street and said, I begin to think about it. So my, my heart began to get bigger and bigger. <laughs> think about what had happened. What if something happened to me today? She's my wife. I love her. I remember the vows. So after a while, he got a hard guy so big he couldn't stand it. And he turned around and back up that way. He went up the street, opened the gate, ran in the door real quick, and shoved the door open, looked around for her, and said, she's standing behind the door crying. Said so he just grabbed her, never said a word, turned around, kissed her, turned around, walked out the door. So he walked on down the gate and started out the gate. Said so he turned around. She stands at the gate and said he waved goodbye. Said so she waved goodbye again. I said, well, what was the matter? What was what? He said the last time it had a feeling in it. <laughs> so that's the way about religion. I like a religion. It's got a feeling in it, you see. So. I'm not but much of a speaker, friend. I thought we'd come down tonight and kind of talk about the Lord for a little bit together. But I'm not much of a speaker, but I pray that God will take the words that we will use and have a feeling in it, you see. That <clears throat> Over in the Scriptures, and St. John, the 11th chapter, I wish to read just a few verses. And usually in the healing services, I'm always fasting and praying, but I've been feasting and talking the last few days. We certainly had a wonderful time, and I seen this little village of New York. <laughs> I invite you all to come down to Jeffersonville someday, <laughs> if you can find it. <laughs> after being here. You wonder if he was really in the city <laughs> when he passed by that. It's population about 25,000, so one good wide street goes through it. So, you... But I tell you, you'll be welcome. <laughs> we sure will be glad to have you anytime you can come by. A latch hangs on the outside of the door down at the Branham place down there, and the only thing you have to do is just pull it and come on in. Now... <clears throat> 
in speaking, I, I am a long ways from being a preacher. I, I don't like to tell people that I'm... One time, when I was first ordained the Baptist church, oh my, did I like to tell people I was a preacher, because I used to think that a preacher was a sissy. I go and somebody told me when I was a kid, said, say you look like a preacher. I'd say, take your coat off. You have to laugh when you say that. <laughs> I didn't want to be no preacher. And so I remember when I first got converted, oh, and they give me my license in the Baptist church as a local exhorter license to do a little evangelistic work. I'd put my Bible under my arm. I'd go down the street. My, when they call me reverend, oh, I was a full-fledged preacher. <laughs> Well, I thought I was all right till I really hit some preachers one day, and then I, I seen puts it in mind of when I was a kid. My dad, he's from Kentucky. My mother was born in Kentucky, and they went west and lived in Oklahoma. I seen somebody laugh, and I said, "Kentucky, there's forgiveness for being born in Kentucky." <laughs> I said to my little boy, I said, "You know, Kentucky's produced some great men." I said, "For instance, who, Daddy?" Billy. And I said, well, I said, Abraham Lincoln. He said, yeah. And I said, Daniel Boone. He said, yeah. I said, your dad. He said, oh, daddy. <laughs> and so when I was, <laughs> I said, well, I said, I remember one time my mother, they went west and she lived in Texas, Oklahoma. So my dad was a fancy writer. He really could ride and a very good shot with a revolver. And so he used to go to rodeos and things, and he would ride. And he used to try to teach me to shoot a revolver. He'd take those big clay marbles and roll one out like that and had two revolvers, and he'd take one, shoot under the marble, and knock it up in the air and burst it with the other before it hit the ground. I couldn't hit a large gun sitting still. So I, I know that I could never do that. But he could ride good. And so I always wanted to be like my dad. So we as kiddies on the farm, you know, and we had an old plow horse. And so of the evening after you get through plowing, I'd go down along behind the barn and had an old watering trough hewed out of a log. How many ever seen a watering trough hewed out of a log? Say, now we're coming home. Getting right down towards home now. And so I'd get all my little brothers and set them along out there on the side of the bank. And I'd get the old horse where dad wouldn't notice it, you see. And I'd go down there and pick me a big handful of cuckleburrs and get the saddle and throw the saddle on the old horse and put these cuckleburrs up under there and pull down the hinges, you know, and climb up on him. Well, the poor old horse so old, you know, and stiff and tired, he couldn't even get his feet off the ground. He'd just ball with them cuckleburrs under there, you know. I'd sit there and take off my hat and say, I'm a cowboy. <laughs> Ride on this poor old horse and he'd just ball, you know, and just jump like that. When I got to be about 19, I'd run away from home. Going out west, I was going to be a cowboy. So I landed in Phoenix, Arizona, just in time of a rodeo. I went down to get me a pair of shafts, and when I buckled them on me, there's about 18 inches of leather laying out on the floor. I looked like one of these little band of roosters, you know, with them feathers. But I said, mm-mm, it's too long-legged out here for me. So I got me a pair of Levi's and went out to the stalls, and they let me in with a pair of Levi's on. I, so I was watching around. So after a while, they said this Kansas outlaw was going to be rode by a certain famous rider. I seen when they pulled, got that horse in that chute. I knew that that wasn't our old plow horse for a long way. They got him up in the chute like this. He had to catch his catch can when he come through. They opened the bull chute there to let him out. And when he did, this famous rider jumped onto the horse. And as they ju he jumped onto the horse, that horse made about one buck, put all four feet, looked like, in a wash pan, and he could have thrown the saddle over the creel fence. And when that guy fell, when that horse threw him, the blood was running from his nose and his ears. The pickups got the horse and the ambulance got the rider. So this fellow come by and said, I'll give anybody a hundred dollars who will ride him a minute. One minute. Anybody. And there was a whole big bunch of cow folks sitting along on the fence, you know. And I was sitting up there with him, you know. Boy, I thought I was a cowboy. And I seen that. He looked, come right up to me, the caller did, and said, are you a rider? I said, no, sir. <laughs> no, sir. I wasn't a rider then when I got around where there's a rider at. And that's the way it was by a preacher. I was a preacher as long as I was in the Baptist church down there. And, but one day I went to St. Louis. I heard a Pentecostal preacher preaching. 
That man would preach till he'd turn red in the face. He would buckle his knees together and sink plumb to the floor, catch his breath. You'd hear him about two squares, come up preaching. Somebody said, are you a preacher? I said, no, sir. <laughs> My old slow Baptist way, he's going to think of it that fast. That's all. So I don't never be careful about calling myself a preacher from then on. So I'm just, I, but what I do know about the Word, I like to talk to somebody else about it. Especially a time like this when you're, my ministry is praying for the sick. And in order to do that, I must come into a, another world that the people know nothing about. There's just no need of trying to explain it. You, you can't do it. And I go to fasting about three days before my service, and it lifts me up into a sphere there that I, well, I just, that's, that's it. And it goes into another dimension that sees things and so forth. Then when the, between the services, some I just let down and go out, and I like to fish and hunt and, and like anyone else. So you see, it's, it's man here, but then man uses, or God uses man to glorify him. And what a privilege it is tonight to come here, open up the Bible, and speak to you on a gospel subject. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will just take the message and bring it out to the people. How many believers are here tonight? Christian believers. Wonderful. Now, I'll tell you what let's do. Let's just, like, take off your collar, you know. <laughs> Let's just be home folks tonight. Would you like to do that? Yes, old home folks. That's the way. That's the way I like to see it. Now, after all, that's about all we are, isn't it? That's all. Now, in the 11th chapter, let's open the Word now and get down to the sincere part. I want to read just a little bit of the Word. For God will bless His Word. He might not mind, but He'll bless His, His Word. Now... And I want to know when I'm speaking this way, preaching, if I happen to hit something that might not seem just like it should be or something. Why, well, remember, this is not under anointing, under that prophetic gift. This is just me preaching. <laughs> All right, me standing up here and let Holy Spirit, I trust, will do it. All right, in the 18th, 19th verse, let's begin. Or the 18th verse, begin of the 11th chapter of St. John. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about 15 furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. And Mary, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But, or I beg your pardon, Martha, as soon as she heard Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still at the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask God, God will give it thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. Let's bow our heads just a moment. Our Heavenly Father, we thank thee from the depths of our heart thy, tonight for the privilege to be gathered together in this lovely church, a memorial of Christ and of lives that's been dedicated to his service. Today, learning that many great renowned people, ones not so renowned to the world, but in the kingdom, has worshipped here in this building. Oh, how I feel tonight standing here on the platform where great man has stood, where great men stand yet, and women. How I thank thee for having the privilege to be associated with them some glorious day in the regions beyond. I trust that we'll all meet there and to thank, sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Daniel. What a marvelous time it will be in the great St. Paul, Peter, James, John, Matthew, Mark, Luke. What a time. Then we come on down to Calvin, Knox, Sankey, Moody, Wesley, Finney, even to our brother Brown and them that minister here, Sophia the washwoman, 
others down through the age. Then the King, Jesus, he'll be there. We shall lay all the trophies that we have at his feet. They all worthy art thou, Lamb, that was slain from the foundation of the world. All that we are is by his grace. And all that we shall ever be is by his grace. We bow our hearts tonight in, in humility to thank him for his goodness. And now, as we as Christian believers have gathered here, and I do not know why, Father, as yet, just why you would have me to stay over, but feeling that maybe tonight we could come together to be blessed. This lovely family that have just been staying with, asking them if there were any blessings that I should render to them, thinking of Elijah of old. None that they could think of. So, Father, may your Spirit come tonight. I know that we all like blessings. We like to feel your Spirit come near us. As Gehazi said, the woman has no children, she's barren, and you gave her the blessing through Elijah. And now, Father, may you come tonight in the Word, the preaching of the Word, and give us a blessing. Uh, bless my heart, Lord, along with these others. Give me spiritual strength for this great journey that's just ahead. Give those... All of we pilgrims, Lord, we profess that we're pilgrims and strangers. We're not of this world because we've been called out and separated by the Holy Ghost. And now we walk in a new life. There's some in here tonight, maybe sick and needy. May while we're preaching, may the Holy Spirit move right into the seat. And now here's what you do. You just receive it. Grant it, Lord. Service is over. May we go home with joyful, happy hearts to meet the task of tomorrow. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, there's no one that can open the Word. We might be able to open the pages that the Word is written on, but it takes the Holy Spirit to reveal the Word. Now, we might take it from a theological standpoint and be able to uh, place our words and our theology and so forth and, and uh, maybe cause some effect to be upon the people by our own brilliances, but that's not what we're seeking right now. We want the Holy Spirit to come down in the church and move in the people. Get around in here just now and bless us with his everlasting blessing. And while we're gathered together and the doors shut tonight, just like it was at the day of Pentecost, wouldn't it be marvelous to hear a rushing mighty wind coming from above, filling all the house where they were sitting? Wouldn't that be marvelous? Now, he's here, and I believe he wants to do it. I trust that he will. Now, you in here, born-again believers, you have the Holy Spirit. Now, the Holy Spirit thrives on one thing. That's the Word. That's what it lives on. It eats and live, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So it's the word. Now in our little scripture lesson tonight, if we take a text, we'd say, believe us out this. And we have these scriptures under consideration just for a few moments. And now let's think of the day of our master the reading of the text brings it to a spot in his life that where he had become very popular he was born with the illegitimate uh, uh, acquisition against him and he came in the way of a stable could you imagine it and in veil he was emmanuel god was in him god was in christ reconciling the world to himself he was a king of glory, came down and tabernacled among man, making himself subject to death, that he might taste death for all the human race. In spirit, he could not. So God created a blood cell in the womb of Mary that brought forth the Son, Christ Jesus, and God dwelt in that body. Jehovah tabernacled in the body of the Son, which was the Son of God. And here he came to a main, by a barn door. He lived a humble life. No place to lay his head, and he went out of the world through capital punishment and shame and disgrace for us. 
And now he was the ensign that was to be lifted up. And I am so thankful tonight that he did that for me and for you. And now, after all these years, we have his favor and fellowship with us by skeptics has arose up and many Bob Ingersolls and so forth has tried to condemn the word and tried to say, well, it was this way and that way and it was days past. But we as Christian Holy Ghost filled people have the Holy Ghost as a witness of the word. See, the Holy Spirit is a witness. Now, not only the word, whatever they want to say about it, that's one thing or another. But we know we have the scriptures right for we have the Holy Ghost as a witness. That's the witness. So God looking down through the, the optical eye as it was and looked down through the, uh, the, the magnifying glass and seeing the end from the beginning. Well, he knew these skeptics would rise and try to twist the word in and out and like that. So he said, I'll not leave you comfortless, but I'll pray the Father and he'll send you another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, and he will abide with you until 1950 <laughs> forever. Amen. That's right. Forever. All right. And he would declare and testify of Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So we have a wonderful witness of that tonight, don't we? That's right. And what kind of a people should we be then? Why we should be free and happy and my no condemnation, living above sin and disgrace, not by our own, but by Him, see? Not what we are, but what He is. God don't accept me for what I am. He accepts me for what Christ has done for me. It isn't my holiness, my righteousness. It's His. I have none to offer. But I just accepted his. <laughs> Amen. So I know he's pleased with that for he said, This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he raised him up from the dead. And just as he raised him from the dead, so shall we be raised. For we are his bride, a flesh of his flesh, bone of his bone, and we shall be with him. Now, and when he came in, what a name he had to suffer under. And along about this time, his ministry, Almighty God, vindicating his son, proving that he was just what he claimed to be. While his ministry, he become very popular at this time because of his miracles and his, his knowledge of, of things and his of prophetic gifts that he knew things before they happened. And many people thought he's just a holy roller or some type of a something, you know, nothing to. But those who loved him and had a touch of him know what he was. Now, what a child he was. Let's drop back just a few pages back and pick up his birth. You know, God, before he does any major thing on this earth, he always sends a forerunner of it. He always does. Now, the, uh, God has angels, and they're all at his command. Do you believe that? They're all at his command. Now, he sends angels, minor. So, he sends angels, major angels. Now, when you see... Gabriel, for instance, coming to the earth or a visitation of his, it's something major fixing to happen. Now, Gabriel announced the first coming of Jesus. And we're taught in the Scripture that he will announce the second coming of Jesus. For he shall sound the trumpet, and time shall be no more. And let's see, back in the beginning when God was fixing to bring forth his son, while well, the first thing he appeared to was to vindicate of his coming was Zechariah, an old priest, fine character, him and his wife, and they'd been married for many years, growing old in age. They had prayed earnestly for children. God seemed to not answer their prayer, but they were serving the Lord, a devout life. Now, there's where many people make an error. They pray for things, and because God don't give it to them in a few minutes, they think they're not going to get it. See? If you ask for anything, don't waver. Believe you receive it, you shall have it. Live right, do right, and believe you're going to get it, and God's faithful who has promised. Amen. There you are. Now, they were living, keeping all the statutes and laws and so forth, and they went down to worship and during the time and Zechariah was a priest at the temple, and his job was to wave the incense while the prayers of the saints were going up out in the congregation while there was a prayer. Uh, Zechariah was waving the incense like this, and when he was waving, he looked standing to his side, 
Say, I believe the Bible said it's at his right side, too. I never thought of that before. I believe it's at his right side. That's where the angel of the Lord always comes to the right. I never thought... Look that up and see if that's right. All right, I believe it is. He stood at his right side. And then when he saw the angel, he was frightened, and he told him that he was Gabriel that stood in the presence of God, and that he came to tell him that his prayers had been answered, and he was going home to live with his wife after the days of the ministration at the temple, and she was going to conceive and bring a son, and is going to call his name John. Well, now I want you to notice something. Look here, a minister of the gospel, a clergyman, well learned, but he failed to believe the angel. He said, how can these things be? I'm old and my wife's old. Well, how could these things be? Why, he said, I'm Gabriel, it's sent from God. He said, and because you've doubted my word, you'll be dumb till the day the baby's born, for my words are going to take effect. When God speaks anything, it's got to be so. And then when he, he said that, why, of course, he was smitten. Now, look, it seems like at that priest, he could look back in the Bible. Here he had plenty of examples of Sarah and Hannah, a few of those back there who, after the past, the age of bearing, received children. But just so routine in his work that he couldn't vary a bit from just what he was taught. And that, that's about the condition the church is today. Isn't that right? Just your regular routine, you know, and it's usually God comes around and interrupts that all the time, you know. That's there with his program. Now, then he failed to believe it and he was smitten dumb and was going to be and he came out and beckoned to the people, but he went home and he was with his wife, and she conceived and hid herself for several months. About six months later, I can see a little virgin by the name of Mary. She lived in the meanest city there was in the world, Nazareth, worse than New York. So then, here, I, I was thinking of the Bowery when I said that. Just a moment. I was down there today. All right. Oh, how my heart went out for those people. I, I wish I lived here. I, I, I believe I'd just like to go down there and just... Them poor human beings in that condition. My heart bleeds for them. Uh, I think anybody's got any heart would see a human being laying soaked in like that. What a condition. Oh, my. Then give them legal license to sell the stuff. There you are. That's a shame, isn't it? But some glorious day the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ. You'll never see nothing like that then. Now, notice, and let's take a drama here for a moment and think it's Monday, the wash day, that is at our home, when I have to pack the water yet even. Then I can see Mary going down to the pump or the well to draw some water in the oriental type. They set it on her head and packing it back up, you know, and she's thinking of of she and of Joseph is to be married and so forth going along uh, holding the pitcher of water on her head and all at once a light shows before her and it startled the little virgin and she stopped and standing in this light stood the mighty Gabriel see something's fixing to take place God sends his angels down there she startled he said hail Mary blessed art thou among women and he told her she was going to bring a child, knowing no man. And he told her about Elizabeth, her cousin, how that she had been barren, and how now that it was so many months with her as mother, all about the story. And said, Now, Mary, you're going to bring a child, knowing no man. And instead of Mary questioning him and arguing like that preacher did, that's a childlike simplicity. She said, Behold, the hands made of the Lord. She never questioned. She just took God at His word. God, give us some more Marys. That'll take God at His word. If God said He'd heal you, believe it. That's all. Take Him at His word. He said, He'd give you the Holy Ghost. Get down there. Stay till it comes. Believe it. Amen. Brother, I'm beginning to feel a little religious right now. I guess that's all right. Uh, I'm at home, am I? Amen. All right. Oh, my. Notice that just take him at his word. And she started praising God before she even had any sign that it was going to be done. 
She didn't know. She never waited until she felt life. She didn't wait till she, something was showing. She just believed it. Yeah. There it is. Say, well, uh, Brother Richie prayed for me last night, but I don't seem to be any better. You'll never be like that. Take God at His word. Start thanking Him for it. Amen. Praise Him until it comes. Oh, that's the way. God give us more Marys. Just accept it. Remember, the Word of God will defeat Satan anywhere. Jesus said with all of his fine qualities, the Father had given me, he said, it is written. When he met Satan, he defeated him right there on the Word of God. Brought it down to a... Say, I'm too loud. Uh, brought it down to a place that anybody, the weakest of Christian, can defeat Satan on the Word of God. When you got the promise, hold on to it. God will bring it to pass. All right. She believed it. No matter what anybody else thought about it, she had the word of the Lord. All right. And if she wanted to tell somebody, you know, usually when you get something from God, you want to tell somebody else about it. There she's going around testifying that she's going to have a baby not knowing any, any man before there's any life or anything. If Mary could do that by something that had never happened before, how much more ought you to do it when you're sick and take him at his word? Thousands are healed every year. You ought to take him at his word. Why, Mary had nothing for an example. The only thing she had was the word. You've got the word plus millions of examples every day. Hallelujah. Amen. The word hallelujah means so be it. <laughs> I mean, hallelujah means praise our God. And he's worthy of all praises. Now, I see her, my, just happy and rejoicing. And she heard about Elizabeth, and she wanted to share the blessing. That's usually the way Christians do. Right up into Judea, she went to, to share the blessing with Mary, or with Elizabeth. And I see her getting up there in Judea, you know, to share the blessing. I can see Elizabeth sitting, maybe doing her knitting. And when she seen Mary coming, my, she threw aside the crocheting or knitting or what it was and run out there and grabbed her in her arms and began to hug her and kiss her. Well, they had feeling. You know what's the matter with the people today? We're getting away from that. Don't feel for one another. What well, used to be when I was a kid, if the neighbor got sick, well, we went over there and cut wood for them, helped them fill the silo, cut their corn, and Mama would go down and wash up the kids and get their breakfast for them. When somebody was sick, but now you don't even know your neighbor's dead unless you read it in the paper. There's no feeling. The Bible said, because iniquity abound, the love of many shall wax cold. There it is. Well, when my daddy would need $50, he'd go over and borrow it from the farmer friend. He'd pay him back when he sold the crops. Well, you couldn't borrow $5 now without a $50 security. That's right. No feeling, no trust. God have mercy on a people. Falling away. That's true. All right. Affections. Love for one another. That's right. They go around here not long ago. Uh, you go downtown, you see somebody, you know, instead of saying, how do you do, or something like that, they just pass a little silly grin, you know, look over like a possum had been in a black gray patch somewhere. Looking over like that, you know, just a little silly grin. Maybe like that. Oh, you know what I like? I like an old-fashioned pump handle handshake. When I was down in Miami with Dr. Bosworth, there was a place down there was having some duke's wife or some great big name for some a duchess, I believe they called her. And she had donated the ground, and she thought she was just about as big as they had to come, you know. And so they're taking me back after the anointing. I've been preaching or praying for the sickness back in the Ten on the outside, trying to get around to myself. Brother Bosworth said, Now, Brother Bram said, We don't want to burden you, but the Duchess wants to see you. I said, Is she sick? I said, No, she just wants to see you. I said, Well, she's no more than anybody else. How about that poor people out there can't get in? I said, Well, she's standing here at the door. Would you just. I said, Well, bring her in. And here she come walking in. I'm not making fun of anybody. But here she comes in with about enough clothes on to put in an aspirin box. That's right. Oh, my. And she had a pair of glasses in her hand on a stick like this. Hold it out. Look, you know that woman couldn't see through glasses like that. Out like that. 
Just putting on the dog. What are you anyhow? Come out there, them glasses help a four like that. She said, are you Dr. Branham? I said, no, ma'am. I said, I'm Brother Branham. She said, Dr. Branham, I'm charmed. She had her hand. I said, get it down here so I'll see you when I know you again. That's what it is. What are you? Six foot of dirt. Amen. No better than nobody else. That's right. Because you got a little money, that don't do any good. When you die, there's no pockets in a shroud. Let me tell you, brother. I was standing by a museum not long ago, and there's two boys looking at the analysis of a human body. A man weighs 150 pounds worth 84 cents. Now, who are you? Got about enough calcium in there that would, well, I don't know why, and then about enough whitewash would make enough whitewash to sprinkle a hen's nest, I guess, to free it from mites. And the mechanic will make up of you and all the ingredients you're worth 84 cents. Put a $5 hat on 84 cents, stick your nose up, it'd rain you drowned. Wrap a $500 fur coat around that 84 cents and go down the street thinking you're somebody. <laughs> That's right. It's true. Brother, I believe in old-fashioned, backwood, sky-blue, sin-killing religion. Amen. I believe when a man gets right from God, or from, but God it straightens him up and makes a new creature in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen. See, that's pretty strong for a Baptist. <laughs> a brother, let me tell you, we didn't get it down in that old-fashioned Kentucky Baptist the way you do today. We didn't walk up and shake one another's hands and put our name on a book. We beat one another back at the altar till we come through. That's the kind of Baptist we need. Hallelujah. Not right, long ago, I was preaching in a little city and a Nazarene brother had been healed. He had his crutches running around over town talking. He said, Brother Brandon, said, I don't get it. I said, what's the matter? He said, why, I said, when you come in here, I said, I thought sure you was a Nazarene. <laughs> he said, and then I seen you with all them Pentecost folks. And I said, well, he's Pentecost. And you're here to say you was Baptist. I don't get it. I said, that's easy. <laughs> I said, I'm a Pentecostal Nazarene Baptist. <laughs> that's what it is. Amen. That's Amen. you're in Christ Jesus by the Holy Ghost. Now, what a time. What we need today, brother, is an old-fashioned shelling out, an old-fashioned revival, bringing us back like they had back in the early days. God lead His church like He did in the early days. I can think of back there a long time ago when God told Moses, He said, I take these children out of this land over into the other land. When they passed through the Red Sea, the separation, the taskmasters that come behind them trying to impersonate them, drowned. And Moses, look at it, after the taskmasters are drowned, Moses got in the spirit. Miriam got in the spirit. Miriam grabbed a tambourine and down the bank she went and beat this tambourine of dancing. Did you ever hear of such? And down the bank she went and beat a tambourine dancing. And here come the daughters of Israel following her dancing. And Moses got in the Spirit and began to sing a song in the Spirit. Brother, if that's not an old-fashioned Holy Ghost meeting, I've never seen one in my life. Right! After they passed over, they promised, God promised to supply everything they had need of. And God promised to supply everything we have need of. When they wanted water, they went to the rock. When they wanted food, they went to the rock. When he wanted some meat, God blew the quails in for him. He promised to supply. Then when he crossed over the sea, they didn't have any bread left. So that night, God rained manna down out of the heaven. Went out and picked it up. He said, now, don't keep too much of it. Just enough for today. You pick up some new tomorrow. See, if he kept it over, it, it, uh, it got wiggle tails in it. That's what's the matter with a whole lot of the Pentecostal churches today, brother. You're trying to live on an experience you had a long time ago, and it's got wiggle tails in it. That's right. Still! Dump it out! Let's have something now. What about now? Yeah, brother. Don't, don't get angry with me, see. I feel pretty good right now. I didn't know I was going to feel this way. All right. Notice. Yes. On with this manna a minute. That manna was a type of the Holy Spirit. That's right. 
God told Aaron, I said, you go out and pick up several homerfuls of it. Take it into the holiest of holies. And there, keep it there. And every generation that comes down after this generation, one after the other, when they come into the priesthood, they had a right to go in there and taste a mouthful of the original manna that fell in the beginning. What a perfect type it is of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When we come out of the world, cross through the red blood of Jesus Christ, killing all the smoking habits, chewing habits, drinking habits, lying habits, stealing habits, laying behind us, we begin to sing and praise God. Amen. What are we going to do to live on? All the picture shows, dances, and big times, clubs, cocktail parties, and everything. You believe in that? Hallelujah, I believe it. When you come through the blood of Christ, it sanctifies you or separates you from the things of the world. Jesus said, if you love the world or things of the world, God's not even in you. You can't mix oil and water. No, sir. You can't mix Christianity with the world. It separates you. The people today are looking for mixers. God said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas. The Holy Ghost separates us from the things of the world. Notice, then... He was a very beautiful type of the Holy Spirit. Our manna that came from God out of heaven. And now look, when we would separate the church back in the beginning, when the Holy Spirit first began to fall, they had come out of their churches and everything to serve God. And then when a, come a sound like a rushing mighty wind come from heaven, filled all the house where they were sitting, manna coming down from God out of heaven, began to fill the church and they run out into the streets of screaming and and talking in other languages and having such a wonderful time till people said, these men are drunk. Look at that. Oh, you say, Brother Branham, I know, but that was for that church back there, is it? Oh, no. Peter told them, everyone, to repent and be baptized, and they should receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, for the promise is unto you and to your children and to them that's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So the, not a mouthful, not a mouthful, but a real heartful of the original baptism of the Holy Ghost that fell on the day of Pentecost is real for the church tonight. For every believer that will break behind the curtain yonder and enter into this priesthood has a right to eat of the original manna that fell on the day of Pentecost, a real old-fashioned Holy Ghost blessing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right. Notice, when they went to eat in this manna, they said, It tastes like honey. <laughs> Did you ever taste any of it? I've been in some meetings to the saints and licked their lips. <laughs> it was so good. Just licked their lips. It reminds me of David of old. David used to, he was a shepherd boy. And he used to carry a, a little uh, a sling that he hunted and kept the bears and lions and things away from his sheep. He had a little script bag here on his side. He used to carry a little stuff in it. And he carried honey in that bag. When his sheep would get sick, why they would, he would go out and put some of this uh, honey on the limestone rock. And the sheep would come up. He'd go to licking on his honey, you know. And when he did, he licked the limestone with it. And the limestone healed the sick sheep. Now, brother, let me tell you. I got a whole script bag full of honey here. And I'm going to put it on the rock, Christ Jesus. And you sick sheep start licking. Now, you're sure to get something. This is certain as the world. Lick! Hallelujah! Taste and see the Lord is good. David said it tastes like honey in the rock. Amen. There's something about a rock, stone. You know, back in the old days when you get mad dog bit, they'd take you to the mad stone. If you stuck, you lived. If you didn't, you died. The worst mad dog I know of is the devil. And I tell you, there's a rock of ages, Christ Jesus. Go hang on to the rock of ages. Take the promise and stick to it. Hold to it. If you stick, you live. If you turn loose, you die. And when you've got God's promise, stay right with it. Until the healing virtue of the saving power of Christ takes you and heals you and makes you well. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. Build your hopes on things eternal. There. How wonderful. How marvelous. Back to your story quickly. Let's get back. I don't want to keep you too long. Now, notice up there when Martha went up to, or Mary went up to meet uh, her cousin, uh, Elizabeth. And then when she went up there, she said, Oh, Mary, I'm so glad to see you. My, how wonderful it is. And was rejoicing. Could you just imagine seeing them, how much love they had one for another? And then you, look what taken place then. Then, as soon as she began to rejoice, she said, You know, said I was told, Mary said, that you was going to have a child. 
and said, oh, how happy I am. She said, yes, I'm going to have a child, but said, I'm just a little worried. Said, it's six months with me. You know, Jesus was, or John was six months older than Jesus. Said, I'm just a little worried because she had no life yet. You know, the baby, as far as she knew, was dead. Well, two or three months in normal uh, motherhood is life, but this is all subnormal. The little John must have been dead in his mother's womb. And she had felt no life as yet. And she was kind of worried. And Mary said, But the Holy Ghost appeared to me too and told me I was to bring forth a son and I was to call his name Jesus. And just as she said, Jesus, little John received the Holy Ghost and began to leap in his mother's womb for joy. Hallelujah! The first time that the name of Jesus come to mortal lips, a dead baby got the Holy Ghost and began to leap. If it brought a dead baby to life, what are it to do to a church that claims to be born again? Hallelujah! Don't think I'm crazy. I know where I'm at. I may get a little beside myself, but I don't want bearing. All right. Makes me feel good. A saint, when that wonderful name of Jesus is first spoken, fell into a human's lips. That real Jesus of Nazareth, when it was spoken to a dead baby, received the Holy Ghost and come to life. And Elizabeth said, Whence cometh the mother of my Lord? For as soon as thy salutation come into my ears, my baby leaped in my womb for joy. And made little old John leap for joy. And what are you to do to a born-again church? Right. Claims already have life. Wonderful. Or right, what kind of a baby must this be? My, after days, Mary, uh, John was born. And as soon as he did, he went off to the theological cemetery or seminary or what you want to call it. It's all about the same, <laughs> a dead place. <laughs> That's right. You know, I always thought of a seminary preacher like an incubator chicken. You know, an incubator chicken, and it's chirp, 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 and you ain't got no mammy at all. And that's just about with an incubator preacher, too. It comes out of one of these seminaries, reading, writing, and arithmetic, and knowing more about God than a rabbit will know about snowshoes. That's right. It's true. Reading, right. I hope I'm scorching somebody. I believe I am, but all right. Brother, let me tell you something. If it don't make you sick, it don't do you no good. My mama used to tell me that about medicine. When I lived in a, out there, we were so poor, we'd have to borrow meat skins or put them in a, an old place, a, an old uh, um, pan, set them back in and borrow them, you know, or get them hot and render out the meat skins, get the grease to put on the, on the corn cakes. And every Saturday night, I know what was coming. Had a big old cedar tub, big old iron kettle. She'd pour the water in there. Every one of us kitties had to take a bath in the cedar tub, and she could scrub harder with them old meal sack towels than I ever seen. And she'd scrub us, you know, and then the next thing, a dose of cast oil every Saturday night, you know. I got so sick of this stuff, I can't even talk about it now, Harley. Every time I'd get into the room, I'd gag, and I'd hold my nose, and she'd pour it on me. I said, Mama, it makes me so sick, I can't stand it. She said, if it don't make you sick, it don't do you any good. So, brother, hold on. <laughs> That's right. If it don't upset you a little bit, get your Christian digestive org is working just right. It might help you a little bit. That's right. Amen. What the church needs today is a good old-fashioned St. Paul's revival in the Bible. Holy Ghost back again. A man and women who live what they profess to be. Anything I hate's a hypocrite. That's right. Go along today and see people the way they do and act and carry on. I was out in California a few days ago, and I went down there to a place where they just go ahead and they said, come down and speak. Now I went down there. Now, all right, get your shockproof jackets on. I was going down there in the... It said, uh, this minister said, now my, my wife is a saint, Brother Branham. I said, I'm sure glad to know that. said, she plays the piano. And I walked up there and she had on enough of this year manicure on her face or what you call it. And her hair was all fringed out like that. And she had fingernails on the top of hers like that. And a great big long earrings hanging down. Looked like a devil been riding on her neck and using them for her stirrup. And looking out like that and her eyebrows way up like this. And she turned around and she said, are you Brother Branham? I said, Brother, did you say that was a saint? said, yes, Brother Branham. I said, she looked like a haint to me <laughs> instead of a saint. Of course, she couldn't. I said, oh, what we need to do is to clean up in the church. Hallelujah. Old-fashioned baptism of the Holy Ghost back in the church. There's so much this green care on we have. Amen. Amen. Walk down on the beach there, and there they, them women profess they have the Holy Ghost laying out there stretched out before men in bathing suits. Hmm. Brother, this might make you vomit. <laughs> but let me tell you something. I've got a girl coming on my cell. 
I said, what are you doing, lady? I said, is now your father a minister? I said, yes, sir. I said, well, see, I'm getting a suntan. I said, if my girl ever stretches herself out like that, she's going to get a suntan. It was going to be Charlie Branham's son. Give her a tan with a barrel slat and bring her home. That's right. I'd tan her. She'd, she'd remember it a long time, too. Amen. Going down like that. Oh, it's just how they got. You let down the bars. An old Methodist preacher was preaching out long ago. He sang a song. He said, we let down the bars. We let down the bars. We compromised with sin. We let down the bars. The sheep got out. But how did the goats get in? You let down the bars. That's what was the matter. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Don't hear very many amens. Amen. That's the truth. Amen. 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 Right. right. Come back to the you and I. Hallelujah. If you want God to return to you with blessings and, and things, get back in the harness again. Preach the gospel. Stand on it. It's either right or wrong. If it ain't right, forget about it. God's Word says it is right. And stay with it. Amen. It'll ring you and twist you and search you and scratch you. And, but it'll fix you up just right. Don't you worry. He's got some healing balm to pour in. All right. I can see then this little John, instead of going out to the seminary to, uh, to begin to learn his, all of his... What kind of stuff is that? What we need today is a revival. Right. Back to the gospel. Power separation. It's true. And I can see uh, back there a little John out there praying to the Lord. After six months, well, of course, after his birth comes Jesus. We know the Christmas story, how Jesus came on earth. Then at the age of 30, John the Baptist came out of the wilderness of Judea, preaching, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yeah. Repentance! Amen. Yes, sir. And when he did, he didn't have his collar turned around the back and some tuxedo coat on. He had an old sheepskin wrapped around him and a, some kind of a lambskin belt around him like that. But he preached this, a sermon that stirred all the regions around about Jerusalem and Judea. That's right. God give us some more Baptists like John. He stirred the regions. What was it? His eloquency? No, sir. Because he had such a great speech? No. Psychology? No. He preached Christ. And the preaching of Christ will stir the people. True. No matter in its simplicity, it's just the greatest drawing card the world's ever known is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not long ago, I seen a picture in a paper I advertised in St. Clair gasoline. It said that one gallon of St. Clair gasoline and a big enough motor could lift the Sphinx so high off the ground. I said, look at there. They're advertising that around the world. And I said, and one drop of the blood of Jesus Christ will raise every sinner to a saint and every sick person to hell again. That's right. And they make fun of me for teaching it. But I believe in the old-fashioned, bloody gospel of Jesus Christ. I believe there's nothing else save in the world, none of our psychology and all of our church joining and shaking hands and forms of baptism has nothing to do with it. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. The blood of Christ that cleanses us, the life is in the blood. It's not in the church, it's in the blood. Amen. Amen. All right. Notice. Then at the age of about 30, John come out preaching. Then one day, we get to our story here. I can see Lazarus come up and say, Oh, there's a great prophet down yonder. And he's his own, so telling Jesus that it's come down and see him. Jesus went with him down to Jordan. I can see him come walking down about the 11 o'clock in the day. And I can hear the little old John across the pond over there. The crowd's got the big head to send him on the other side. The priest on the other side said, Rabbi, do you mean to tell me that there will come a time when the daily sacrifice will be taken away? He said, there will come a time when a man will die for the sins of the world. I hear the, the priest say, oh, you're wrong, Rabbi. He said, there will come a... To behold, <laughs> there comes the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He said he knew him because there's a sign following him. He seen him come in with his blue robe on, walking down through there, and his hair blowing. John fainted, or Lazarus, I mean, and fell to his feet. Jesus walked straight out into the water, was baptized in obedience to the Father, walked back out to the bank, and the heavens was open, and God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. Come hear him. He started out in the ministry, and the powers and signs began to follow him. Devils begin to scream. The preachers called him a devil, and the devil called him the Son of God. <laughs> Just about as bad today. 
Say, I'm scorching preachers with some means. I don't mean that to be you, my brother. I'm glad he... he said, All right. But it is. You can go talk to a preacher about the signs and wonders. Say, ah, that's the devil. And the devil turned back and said, it's the power of God. There's the difference. Like Paul and Silas up there one night and all them people were saying, these are imposters. These men turned the world upside down. They're imposters, the preachers. And a little old fortune teller sat on the street and said, they're the man of God to tell us a way of life. Yeah. After their devils recognized it before, people have professed to be Christians and believers. And that's right. They recognize the power of God. They have some conscience of, of what a spirit means. And all we know is just a little reading, writing, and arithmetic and a little self-made knowledge. I tell you what we need today is an old-fashioned revival. Thank a man God. get down and pay the price Amen. and lose sight of the world and what's around him. He can move into a spirit with God and carry there with the Holy Ghost until power comes. Amen. 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 Pentecostal people, you had that not long ago. You did run well. What hindered you? Is that right? True. You lay down the bars. And every church that ever lay down the bars is put on the shelf. That's right. And God started something different. All right. Warm up to God. Come back to Him. Throw your heart out to Him. I was reading a sermon the other night by her sister Brown here at the conference down there and how she preached the Calvary Road, a road of sacrifice. What a masterpiece of a sermon that was. What people need today is get back on that self-sacrifice. Lay your all on the altar and forget who you are but the Son of God or the daughter of God. Walk forward. Claim every promise God's got for you. There will be a revival that will shake New York like it's never shook before. Amen. Men come back, men and women come back to God. Come back to the place. I don't mean come back to church. I mean come back to God. Let every home start a revival. That's right. Turn out the beer can. Throw out the card party. Hallelujah. Excuse me. Amen. What we need today is an old fashioned God sent revival. Clean up the home. Clean up the heart. Get things ready. Start a revival in your home and it'll begin at the church. Preacher, don't bring it in his briefcase. God sends it from heaven to the individuals. That's true. Then I can see back there in them days when Jesus went forth and demons screaming signs of following. It got just about the time where our text begins now. And I want you to notice him. There he was. And he went away from the home of Lazarus. And as soon as he left the home, sorrows and troubles come in. And when he leaves your home, sorrows and troubles are coming in. They're headed your way when he leaves your home. In this case, he wasn't driven away. He went away because his work called him. And Satan seen the advantage of it. So he strikes Lazarus down. I believe Jesus knew at all time that Lazarus is going to die. For I can prove it with the Scriptures. When he got at the grave of him, when he's back where our land, friend Lazarus sleepeth, but said, for your sake, I'm glad I wasn't there, but I go wake him. <laughs> One of the grave, he said, Father, I thank thee, thou hast already heard me. But I said it just because he was standing by. He said, I can do them, but what the Father shows me, he done showed him the resurrection of Lazarus, and that's the reason he left. Yeah. Now, I can see him after the dark hour struck, the doctor comes and said, Boy's dying. We're taught by, I don't know where this could be proven or not, but he had hemorrhages of the lungs, and they bled him a few times, and he died. When they died, they packed him out and embalmed his body and laid him in the grave. First day passed, oh, how sad. Second day passed, oh, how sad. Third day passed, my. Fourth day, Lazarus down there and his skin worms was crawling in and out of his body. Corruption had set in. The saddest hour that little home had ever seen. You know how it is. You had death in your home. And there, the saddest hour, the man they'd put confidence in had come out of their church. Those who confessed Jesus had to leave the Sanhedrin. So they're just put out as fanatics. Could not come back. They give up their church and everything. For Jesus, expecting him to be fine. They sent for him to come pray for Lazarus. Instead of coming praying for Lazarus, he went on and ignored the prayer. Well, if some of you here would ask your pastor to come pray for him and he didn't come right away, well, you say, the old hypocrite, I'll go over and join the other one. <laughs> that's right. And he never told me to say that. But that's true. The reason a pastor can't do nothing for you a day, the man of God, you've got to have some faith in him. If you ain't got no faith, it don't do you a bit of good. Isn't that right? Now, like uh, the Shunammite woman and so forth, you have to have faith to believe. Now, the man of God could not help if you didn't believe. 
Now here comes Mary and Martha and their dark hours that come. Jesus had failed them, seemingly. All hopes is gone. That Everything was in the black. And the first thing you know, the darkest hour they had, then Jesus come along. He usually comes just at that dark hour, doesn't he? How wonderful. I remember the darkest hour I ever seen. When I was laying out in my old brother's hospital, the doctors looked at me and said, there's not an earthly chance for you to ever be well, Reverend Brandon. Two years ago, said you have broke yourself, your whole nerve system is regurgitating, you can't keep nothing on your stomach, you never will. Said you're finished for life. And there was hot tears rolling down my cheeks, knowing that my life is ending. Like I hooked up, I said, Father. And about that time, Jesus come along. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, my. He comes right at the darkest of hours. It was the darkest of hours. The woman with a blood issue had ever seen. She had spent all of her money. Then Jesus come along. It was the darkest hours that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had ever seen. Then Jesus come along. It was the darkest hours that Jairus had ever seen when he said his little daughter, 12 years old, had done died. Then Jesus come along. It was the darkest hour that old blind Bartimaeus had ever seen down there. Then Jesus come along. That's right. He's always there at the darkest of hours. The darkest of hours. And somebody said, the master's come. I can see Martha. She had been dilatory about a lot of things. Of the gospel, but this time faith took up, and here she went. I hear some of them saying, Ah, there she goes. Where'd that holy roller preacher go that was preaching divine healing around here called Jesus of Nazareth? When his buddy got sick, see, the job is too big, so he skipped town. See where it's at? But she didn't care what they said. I hear say, Oh, look at her now. I wonder where a holy roller preacher is at now. And here she goes down the street, pushing right past them old believers. That's what you got to do, too. Go right, them old unbelievers, just go right on and pass them. Went right on out into the country. And when she seen Jesus, now it looked like she could have berated him. Looked like she had a right to. What if she went up and said, now, looky here. That, this is a 1950 virgin, the 51. Why didn't you come when I called you? <laughs> I'll join the Methodists. I had more... I, they, they treat me better over there than they do over here. <laughs> That's the reason you can't get nothing done. If she had took that attitude, the miracle would never happen. It's your, it's your attitude towards the divine gift of God which determines what's going to happen. Always, always. Watch them on a platform sometime in a healing service. Watch the attitude that come in. Here the other night, I remember a lady come up there with just about... In the, well, didn't have enough faith hard to get to the platform. She'd been in prayer line after prayer line. I know the woman was going to get well. I seen her coming up there. I knew it wasn't. She didn't have the right attitude when she came up to get well. She can't do it. I said, the Lord Jesus bless you, sister. Go, may he heal you. That's all I could say. See? But it's just not there. She'd wash you, been here and there and everywhere. You see them like that. You can't do that. You've got to take God at his word. Here a few weeks ago, a man came up to me and he said, Brother Ranham said, I went out and I tried Freeman. He couldn't do me any good. I went to Osborne. He couldn't do me any good. I went to Ogilvy and he couldn't do me any good. I went to Roberts. I said, now I've come to you. I said, you're going away the same way. That's right. I said, you're going to the wrong person. Go to God. Not to some man. What can we do? Nothing. It's him that's already done it. Just to believe his word and accept it, it'll, be, it'll take place. But until then, it won't do you a bit of good, no matter where you go. You're going away from here just as disappointed as you went away in the other places. Because your heart isn't right with God. Or I don't say it was any moral acts now. But if your heart isn't right with God, you can't believe. That's true. So he, he went away the same way. Now, look. When Jesus came along, Martha went out to him and she said, Now look, instead of upbraiding him and scolding him, she went out and the right kind of an attitude she came to him. She fell down at his feet and said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. Oh, now you're getting somewhere. Now, look how she regarded that gift of God. She said, Lord, that's what he claimed to be. Do you believe it? Yes. said, Lord, if thou would have been here, no matter whether you come or whether you didn't, that's all in the past now. Whether you come or didn't, that doesn't matter. But if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. Now, I believe what Martha saw in there, she had been reading the Scriptures, and she seen where that Shunammite woman back there, when she, Elijah come out, blessed her, 
She brought forth a son. When he was about 10 or 11 years old, he had a son stroke out in the field. He must have, because about 11 o'clock then, he cried, my head, my head, died on his mother's lap. And a mother said, now you saddle an ass and go forward for me, and don't you check, lest I tell you. Said, go to the man of God, to Mount Carmel. And her husband says, neither Sabbath or new moon, he won't be there. She said, all will be well. I like that. I like that. It'll be all right. Don't worry about that. I'll go. All right. And then and she said, well, now, wait, the boy's dead. But look, she didn't know whether Elijah was going to raise the boy or not. But she knew this, that God in that age was operating through his prophet. God was in the prophet. And if she could get to the prophet, she might not get the resurrection of the child, but she would know why the child died. And she could only get to the prophet because that was God's representative in heaven then. So she went forward. She went to Elijah. And when she comes, and Elijah didn't know what was the matter. And look, when she snowed, oh, God being in Elijah, I want you to listen closely now. Is it closed? He said, now, look. He fell down, Gaza had jerked her up. My, that was awful around his master. He said, she said, why did you deceive me or don't deceive me? And he recognized them when she explained that the baby was dead. He said, Gehazi, you take my staff and you go lay it on the baby. Now, I think that's where Paul must have got the doctrine of laying handkerchiefs on the people and took off his body. Elijah knew that God was in him, though he was a man, but God was in Elijah. Do you believe that? God was in his prophet. Now, listen to this on divine healing here just a minute. And now Elijah knew himself that what he touched was blessed. But if he could get the people to believe that. Paul, the people recognized the Holy Ghost in Paul because they seen the way the operation of the Holy Ghost, God vindicating it, they had it. He was God's prophet. And they seen that. He was God's mighty one, the apostle. And they recognized that. And so he took a handkerchief off of his body and aprons and sent to the people and unclean spirits went out of them. And they were healed. See? He knew what he touched was blessed. And so did Elijah. So he said, take my staff and told the Gehazi, said, now don't you look right or left or speak to nobody. Go lay it on the child. But that woman, she didn't know whether the power laid in the staff or not, but she knew God was in Elijah. That's where God was at in his prophets. She said, as the Lord liveth and your soul liveth, I'll not leave you. I like that. I'm going to be right with you. <laughs> I'm going to find out about this. All right. He tried to make her go on. No. She said, I'm going to stay right here. So Elijah girded his loins up and tucked. Away he went. When he got to the place, Gehazi done got there and laid the staff on the child. No breath, no life. Come back and oh, how mournful it was around the home. I can see the old prophet walking, you know. She took him and laid him on the bed where the prophet had laid. Very good place to put him. That's right. Put the dead baby there. And the prophet walked in. It wasn't his prayer that done it. Now watch. The prophet walked up and down in the floor. Back and forth. Waiting. And he went over. And he laid his body on the baby. Then he got up. He walked back and forth. Where was God at? In his prophet. Walked back and forth. Back and forth. He went and stretched himself out upon the body of the baby again, put his nose against his nose, his eyes against its eyes, his lips against its lips, and laid there. And the baby sneezed seven times and come to work, come to life, said, go get that human eye. Here, here, here's the baby. And if Mary, Martha here, could read in the Bible and see that the Shunammite woman got the desire of her heart because she recognized that God at that age lived in his prophet, how much more was he in his son? Amen. There he was. Amen. God was in his son, reconciling the world to himself. She knew that. She ran up to him in the right attitude. She said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will do it. Amen. Something has happened now. She's at the right place before the right divine person with the right mental attitude speaking the right words, believing the right things, them old cogs is working right together. Something has to happen. When you take that kind of faith, something's got to happen. She said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not die. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will do it. You might have been crippled a long time, sister. But even now, he's sitting at the right hand of God to make intercession. The little girl may have always have to wear those braces and that polio, sister. See. You might have to do that, but even now, Lord, see, 
You might be sitting here with a cancer saying, the doctor told me I had to die, but even now, Lord, whatever, you might have been to every doctor there was in the city. He told you there's no hope for you, but even now, Lord, whatever you ask, God, God will do it. And he's sitting at the right hand of the Father Amen. to make intercessions upon his death, burial, and resurrection. Hallelujah. There he is. Even now, Lord, whatever you ask, God, God will do it. Amen. And there he sits in his majesty, sitting by the side of the Father, at the right hand of him up there to make intercessions. Amen. Upon anything that you ask him and confess that he's done it, he'll confess it before the Father. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What more do you want? Glory to God. Amen. Say, Lord, I accept you as my healer. I'll never say nothing else but what I'm healed. That's settled. He God. can't do nothing for you till you first confess it. Thank he's God. a high priest of your confession. In that case, not even to your faith. And it couldn't be faith until you confess it. You've got to accept faith, believe it, and confess that it already is done for. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Amen. How many says that church wise? Yeah, amen. If you believe you're going to be healed tonight, it's saying, if your faith says you're going to be healed, it's sure as your sight says that's why it's over. Thank I don't God. care what you look like, what you feel like, it's over. Glory to God. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence Thank of things not seen. Let's go. Amen. What is that? That's the Is that right? Somebody said seeing was believing. Did you see it? Did you uh, taste it? Smell it? How did you know it was plain? You heard it. Stand up here a minute, brother. There stands a man before me with a brown suit on a red tie. How many believes it? How do you know it? You've got five senses of the human body, stay there. You've got five senses of the human body, haven't you? See, taste, feel, smell, and hear. Is that right? Now, I know he's standing there because I see him. You said, I'm from Missouri. You have to show me. All right, seeing is believing. It is. The man's standing there yet. I don't see him and I can't see him. It's impossible to see him in this position. You want to argue with me? He's not there. You try to. That's that same man standing there. How do I know? Because I've seen? No, sir. I have another sense separate from seeing, which is feeling. And I know he's there. And my sense of se- uh, sight cannot see him, but the sense of faith, which is a separate sense, declares that he is there. I know it because I know my feeling is right. Now, I can't touch him with that sense at all. See? But I know he's there by another sense, which is sight. Is that right? Thank you. Faith Amen. is an individual sense besides any of that. It's the, the sixth sense. Yes. That's the outside man that God put in the human flesh here, giving five senses to contact his earthly home. And the inside man, the spirit, has two senses. And that is unbelief and faith. Yes. And when your faith says, that you're going to be healed the same as your sight says. If that man had on a red tie and a brown suit, it's over. For faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things you do not see, taste, see, smell, or hear. Thank God. Amen. There you are. You believe it. And you can't accept it now until you do believe it, and you've got to believe it before it'll act. You see what I mean, friends? People stand on the platform and say, well, why don't something happen? Why don't... It can't happen. Until you first believe it, accept it, and confess that it's right. Take a woman, come to the altar, hear a man. Let him be ever so vile. They just scream and cry and walk up down the altar saying, God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me. Day in and out, day in and out, and they just keep pacing. Lord, I've repented. I've done everything I can do. They'll keep pacing until the hour when in their heart they believe it and then confess it. And when they confess it, he goes to work on it, and he cannot intercede for you until first you confess that it's already done by faith, for he's the high priest of your confession. Yes, amen. 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 I feel pretty good. Getting ready, God, let you go home. But let me tell you, brother, when a man or a woman will step out virgently on the promise of God and say, I believe it. Hallelujah. Walk out in the street saying, I believe it, I believe it. I believe it. Then it's going to 
to happen. Uh, Telling it it is an actual Abraham. Twenty-five years before the baby was ever born, he confessed that it was going to be so. Bought up the pins and the bird eye and everything got ready. That's right. Brother, I'm telling you, then after 25 years, after you received the promise, the baby was born. But he believed God and know that he was able to keep that which he had said he would do and keep his word. So faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things you do not see, taste, feel, smell, or hear. The old hypocrite sitting in the church saying, oh, I've never seen nothing done. You are... <laughs> I better let you go. <laughs> let me tell you, brother. Let me tell you what you need tonight. What you need tonight is an old-fashioned stirring in the soul. Until I went in to a place not long ago and was having a healing service in the back of the room, the psychopathic cell. I went back there and there was lunatics sitting there in their, in their straight jackets and things. There said a beautiful young lady sitting there. I said, how do you do? You got your patient? She said, I'm the patient. I looked down there and I said, what's the matter? I said, I don't know, sir. She said, I was a little girl, said, I took the road, it's wrong. She said, I was raised a Catholic. She said, and then I, they picked me up for a prostitute, sent me to the Good Shepherd's home. I served a time. Said, I come back from there and said, went right back into it again. Said, then they picked me up and sent me away to a woman's prison. I served two years there. Said, I come right back, a drunkard, a cigarette fiend, and come right, beautiful woman. Come right back, and she said, I did it again. They told me I ought to change my religion. I went over and joined a certain church, and I went down and, and prayed the way they prayed, and I've tried everything, and I'm still just as much prostitute as I ever was. I said, you've never touched God yet, sis. She said, I said, let's pray. She got out, and she prayed, and she prayed, and I tried to speak to her. She said, well, Brother Branham, she said, I, I believe I'm going out. I said, no, you're not. I said, you're going out to do the same thing. I said, look, lady, it's the devil. I said, you don't want to do that. A woman as pretty as you are and made the way you are would be an idol for any man's heart. Don't you like to be a little mother and have some children like other ladies? She said, I've always wanted Brother Abraham. and said, I can never have it like this. I said, you don't want to do that. She said, no. I said, something drives you to it. She said, that's right. I said, it's the devil. She said, I always thought it was. And I said, but Jesus Christ, the Son of God, said in my name they shall cast out devils. Believe this? And she said, yes, sir. We went to prayer there for a little bit. After a while, the power of the Holy Ghost come. I never said a word. Just pray. She raised up in that big black eyes with tears dropping down. She said, Brother Branham, something's happened to me. I said, it's over now, sis. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Over now. Ah, she waded into the blood of Jesus Christ and it cleansed her. The demon power. She got married last year. She go to have a child now. What's the matter? The blood of Jesus Christ cleansed her. No matter how much this, that, and the other, you've got to have something strike you, brother, vile. That settles it forever. That's faith. Jesus is the high priest of your confession. Whatever you confess that he's doing, he'll do. You, a lot of people look at symptoms. You say, well, brother, Brown, my hand's no straighter. It'll never be as long as you look at it. We don't look to that. We look to God's promise. Talk about symptoms. Look at Jonah down the belly of the whale. If anybody could have had symptoms, he had them. Backslidden, <laughs> hands tied behind him, out on the sea, a storm come up, pitched him out, whale swallowed him, went to the bottom of the sea, and he fished when he, fe when he feeds, he goes down and rests his f fins on the bottom of the sea. And there he was down there with a belly full of backslidden preacher, laying down there on the banks, down there under the sea, a storm on the sea, backslidden. What a condition he was. He looked this way, it was whale's belly. He looked that way, it was whale's belly. Everywhere he looked at this whale's belly. You know what he said? He said, I'm not looking at that whale's belly. He said, they're lying vanities. He said, Lord, once more I'll look to your holy temple. Hallelujah. He didn't see whale's belly. He seen God's temple. For he knew this. Well, when that temple was dedicated, Solomon prayed and said, Lord, when the Holy Ghost come in and that fire settle down behind the holy place, Solomon said, if thy people be in trouble anywhere and pray, then you hear from heaven and Jonah believed that God heard Solomon's prayer. And he said, I'll look to your temple. And it made that old whale kind of feel funny. God put an oxygen tank down there, kept him alive three days, and took him right on over to Nineveh. And if God could do that and would hear Jonah's prayer in the belly of the whale, he's none of you that bad off tonight. No symptoms like that. Certainly not. You're at least here on, on the ground yet. And if, if God would hear Jonah's prayer and Jonah praying like that and God respected his prayer to an earthly temple where an earthly man dedicated 
and a prayer of an earthly man had it went up over the temple and Jonah could believe that and make the whale throw him out, how much more ought you and I sitting in the little sickness was I'm going to look to thy holy temple where the Son of God sat to the right hand of the Father, making intercessions upon our confession. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Brother, I wish I was twice my size. Maybe I could feel twice that good. I feel pretty good right now. Trying. Amen. Thank God. Got my hand in a honey jar. <laughs> Licking as hard as I can. You may call me Holy Roller, so go ahead. You're going to brand me that way anyhow. I might as well have a good time while I'm standing here. I got to go to Africa in a healing service now. I'm just having a good time. Amen. All right. I got to hurry. Close. Where was we at in the message? <laughs> all right. I preach in Genesis or Revelations. Anyhow, it's all the book. So then the first thing you know, I can see Martha fall down and say, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatsoever you ask God, God will do it. God will give it to you. Why, Jesus, I can see him straighten his little self up. The Bible said there's no beauty of him we should desire. Not a great big seven-foot square shoulder man. A little frail-looking fella. In them days, of course, Solomon, you know, or, or Saul was a seven-footer and so forth. He was a big, handsome-looking man. But Jesus, a little frail fellow, he straightened himself up. Mary said, Martha had said to him, said, huh, If you'd been here, my brother not to die, but even now, whatever you ask God, God will do. Jesus said, Thy brother shall rise again. <laughs> not much to look at, but brother, what was wrapped up behind that robe? Yes, sir. So thy brother shall rise again. She said, Yeah, Lord. I know he was a good boy. He'll raise in the last day at the general resurrection. Look at him and I see him straighten himself up. Then my eyes turned sideways and said, I am the resurrection life. <laughs> He's still the resurrection life. He was the resurrection life for that little boy in Finland. For that lady down on her that had got killed in that automobile accident. He was the resurrection life for that boy who was drowned. Sure. He's the resurrection and life. I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Hallelujah. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said, Yea, Lord, I believe every word of it. Hallelujah. I believe that you are the Son of God, like you said you were, that would have come into the world. That were you, lady? Oh, my. Something's got to happen now. Hey, peace. Be still. He was more than a man then. The waves and the winds obeyed him. He was the God-man. He was divine. That's right. And when he died up there, Calvary screaming and crying for help. My God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? He was a man in his death, but in his resurrection he proved he was the divine Son of God. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Believe us out of this. I believe he's the one that sent the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost. Believe us out of this. I believe he's here right now and would heal every sick person in the building. Believe us out of this. I believe he'd fill everybody with the Holy Ghost right now. Believe us out of this. I believe he would bless and he'd the Believe us out of this. I believe he's here to pour out his spirit. Send out an old fashioned Holy Ghost Pentecostal blessing on us now. Believe us out of this. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe it to heal this woman with these braces right now. Believe us out of this, sister. I believe it to heal your baby, the polio there. I believe us out of this. How many sick people in the building? Raise your hand. I believe it to heal you right now. Believe us out of this. Believe us out of this. Let us stand to our feet. Do you mean business? Do you mean the truth? Do you do it? All right, lady, get ready to get your braces off your child. All right. Every one of you believe it? Hallelujah. Put your hands over on one another now. Are you ready to make a confession? Are you ready to believe God? Where are you? You believe it now? The Holy Ghost is in the building. Hallelujah. Believe us out of us? He's ready to take you right now at your word. Are you ready to confess it? Are you ready to say, I'll never no more say I'm sick? I'll testify the healing right now. I'm willing right now to receive it, Lord. Come into my life. Come into my heart right now. Take away this. Make me a new creature. Believe us out of this. I believe he's healing the people right now. Believe us out of this. Almighty God, author of life, giver of every good gift, send thy blessings upon this people. Heal. Oh God. Stretch 
forth your hands upon this people and may their hearts be quickened. May the Holy Ghost fall in this building just now like a rushing mighty wind. Go over these people. Heal every one of them, Lord God, with your great divine power. May it sweep over this audience in the name of Jesus. Satan, come out! In the name of Jesus Christ, we adjure the devil to leave every person in here. Almighty God, receive them into your kingdom. Raise up your hands. Praise God. Thank Him for your healing. Thank Him for your healing. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. 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 Praise be to our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Receive your healing right now in the name of Jesus. Testify. Tell your neighbor, I'm healed. I'm healed. I believe. With all my heart, I believe. 